Next hour, survivors and heroes, voices from 9-11. Here's Gary Tuckman. For New York City firefighter Damian Van Cleef, the second Tuesday of September started as a routine morning. I was just coming into work. I just uh, relieved someone else. They went home and uh, just doing what we do every morning. He and the other firefighters of Engine Company 7 reporting for duty that day had no idea of the drama about to unfold. Their station stood in the shadow of the World Trade Center. The lieutenant's test was coming up in October. So uh, we were up in the room studying when the run for the gas leak came in. While out investigating that gas leak, they noticed something that was anything but routine. I heard a vibration, and then we all looked up and saw the plane. Something was wrong. We, you never see a plane in downtown Manhattan, especially that low. I could see almost every detail on a plane. That's why I knew it was way too low. The firefighters watched in shock as the plane slammed into the north tower of the World Trade Center. By the time we actually realized what was going on, we pretty much threw all our gear on the rig and, and uh, we started to respond down to the Trade Center. Engine 7 was one of the first companies to arrive on the scene. <laughs> Remember taking an, an extra couple of seconds before running in to make sure we had everything and make sure we were ready to go because this was going to be a big one. Janelle Guzman was working on the 64th floor for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey when she felt the building shake. I was scared. I mean, the building shake, and they said an airplane hit the building, but I had no idea where, where the building was hit. The North Tower was hit between the 96th and 103rd floors. While the tower blazed above, the 30-year-old Trinidad native was told by Port Authority officials to stay put. Watching the horrific scene from fire department headquarters across the East River in Brooklyn, New York City Fire Chief Pete Gancy and his right-hand man, Steve Mosiello. We saw the, the smoke billowing, the fire, and that uh, people were in trouble. People out there were definitely in trouble. They raced across the Brooklyn Bridge in Chief Gancy's car. Also with them, Danny Nigro, then the Fire Chief of Operations. I said to Pete, this is going to be the worst day we've ever had. And uh, little did I know, it was even worse than I imagined. The three made it to the scene in less than 10 minutes. Gancy immediately set up a command post on the ramp to a garage near the North Tower. We were standing with the chief, and we heard somebody yell, you know, there's another plane. I didn't see it immediately. And then it came into the range of my hearing, and I heard it. And it sounded louder and louder and louder. And there it was, went right into the building, into Tower 2. Now we have a real problem on our hands. We have two buildings hit by planes, thousands and thousands of people trapped. One of those still trapped inside the North Tower, Janelle Guzman. She was making frantic calls for advice on what to do. I started crying and made phone calls to my family and stuff. And I told them, OK, um, I'm just waiting on instruction to get out. And uh, I told my boyfriend, I said, well, I'm leaving. So I told her, you know what, just meet me outside Century 21. That's across the street from the World Trade Center. And I left. Moments later, Guzman tried to call again. She got his cell phone voicemail and left this final message. I'm still inside the building. Um, I don't know. We have to wait until somebody come and get us out. Okay? I'll try and call you back again. Bye. I love you. End of message. Downstairs, the men of Engine 7 had arrived to a scene of horror. It was just all burnt. Everything was burnt. There were people on fire. That we, we literally put them out, but we just had to, we had to leave. We had to go head up. I mean, they were just... I don't know, everything was just burnt. They began making their way up the stairs of the North Tower with other firefighters, then the unthinkable. While we were operating up on the 21st floor, you know, there was a sick vibration. 
That vibration was the South Tower collapsing next door. After that vibration, and it seemed like the, it was just something that wasn't right. And um, eventually, uh, I heard the uh, order to vacate, to back out, to evacuate the building. Outside, in the chaos of the South Tower's collapse, Chief Gancy and his executive assistant, Steve Mosiello, had somehow managed to escape. And we all retreated into the uh, basement of uh, Two World Financial. The basement was full of dust. You couldn't breathe. We couldn't find a way to get out. Everybody who was in there, we finally found a staircase, and we all got out. When all of the people came out of uh, the basement of the World Financial Center, out of the parking garage, and uh, Pete sent everyone north to put a command post in a safe location, a safer location. That moment would forever haunt Steve Mosiello. Pete Gancy had sent him away and then walked into danger. This specific day, I felt I should be as close to him as possible because there was a lot going on. Just moments after Chief Gancy radioed Mosiello his location, the North Tower fell. Get out! Get out! Come on, the tower just fell out! I was thinking the worst. I was honestly thinking the worst at that point. When People in the News continues, dealing with the disastrous aftermath. I kept trying to reach him, and I got no response. Welcome back to People in the News. Here's Gary Tuckman. Engine 7 was one of the first companies to arrive on the scene. Some of the firefighters had made it up as far as the 31st floor of the North Tower, the first tower hit in the terrorist attack. When the South Tower collapsed next door, the order came to evacuate. We just got to the lobby, and uh, there was no one there. It looked like the end of the world. Janelle Guzman, a 30-year-old mother and administrative assistant for the Port Authority, was not far behind. After waiting for almost an hour, she decided to make her way down from her office on the 64th floor, down to her boyfriend waiting for her outside. Only 13 flights to go. It was like, boom, that was it. We felt everything, and I, when we fell to the ground, and then everything started crumbling faster and heavier. So were you there when the second building collapsed? I saw the, the antenna actually coming down. So you thought she was dead? Definitely. Coordinating the rescue efforts outside, the highest ranking uniformed officer of the fire department, Chief Peter Gancy. Three decades on the force, father of three. Pete Gancy was not only Steve Mosiello's boss, he was his best friend. It was a marriage. I didn't want to make my mom jealous or anything, but it definitely was. He spent more time with my father than we did. Gancy had helped Mosiello find a home in his neighborhood right across the street. The two worked in each other's houses. They played golf together. The usual bet, a dime a hole. Their days often began hours before sunup. They would then drive into work together. I would get up early in the morning, 4.15, put the coffee on, open the back door for my deck, go take my shower, do my routine, and I'd come down, he'd be, he'd be sitting there waiting for me. He'd be drinking his coffee and smoking and doing whatever we did in the morning. But September 11th was no ordinary day. Chief Gancy wasn't even scheduled to work that morning. He had been called for jury duty. We were passing uh, one of the parkways that would have brought us towards the courts. I said, you know, do you want to go to jury duty and make an appearance? He said, Steve, I have so many meetings today. Uh, we, you know, we just can't get there today. That morning would be the last one they would spend together. After Gancy ordered Mosiello away to get back up, the fire chief began walking toward the debris of the South Tower's collapse. Moments later, the North Tower fell, burying him under four feet of rubble. Both towers were gone. And so was Steve Mosiello's best friend. I kept trying to reach him, and I got no response. 
it was so eerie because the chaos of radios at a fire scene, there's always conversations going on. And after that building came down, you heard absolutely nothing, nothing at all. Janelle Guzman remembers the silence too. She had dropped 13 floors, surviving the collapse of the North Tower. But her head was pinned between two concrete pillars, her legs trapped in a staircase. I waited to, you know, to see if I hear anybody call out anything. I heard nothing. The light peeking through the concrete eventually gave way to darkness. I think I was going to die because when I saw that it became dark and no one came and I'm not hearing any noises nowhere around. It's like, no, I'm not going to make it. I'm going to die here. I'm going to see myself slowly dying. By dusk, one by one, the firefighters of Engine 7 began to find their way back to home base. The entire team had escaped the North Tower with just minutes to spare before the building came crashing down. You know, everything happened so quick. I mean, that building came down, I, I think, literally in 10 seconds, and I was able to run maybe one block. Engine 7 escaped without losing a single person. If we were one more floor, if we were two more floors, what would it have, you know, what would have happened to us? I said, so I believe if we were two more floors, well, we would have been dead. Pete Gancy was not as fortunate. Steve Mosiello helped recover his friend's body from the rubble. It was up to Mosiello to give the Gancy family the bad news. Here I am, his best friend, his closest friend, his aide, his executive assistant, his driver, everybody, and I'm standing before them and he's not. When People in the News continues, it's Janelle Guzman's dark hours trapped beneath tons of concrete. I ask God to show me a miracle and to show me a sign that I'm going to get out of here today and not the next day. And the painful struggles of moving on. I play that day over every day that I'm awake. That day gets played out in my mind. We now return to People in the News. The morning after, smoke billowed from the site that used to be the World Trade Center. The haggard firemen of Engine 7 joined in the arduous round-the-clock dig for victims. Trapped under tons of debris, Janelle Guzman had all but given up. She prayed and drifted in and out of sleep. The next day after I woke up and I started to pray again, I asked God to show me a miracle and to show me a sign that I'm going to get out of here today and not the next day. And it so happened that I heard noises, like people moving stuff. And I yelled out, and someone answered back. 27 hours after the North Tower's collapse, Guzman made contact with rescuers. And then I took a piece of concrete and I knocked the stair above me. And then they heard the knocking and then they started to come closer. And then uh, I put my hands through a little crack in the, in the ceiling, like in the wall. And I felt the, the, the person hold my hand, the fireman held my hand. And he said, I got you. And I said, thank God. Her legs were crushed, her eyes swollen shut. But Janelle Guzman was clear of the concrete, the dust, the darkness. She would be the last person pulled alive from the wreckage. The phone rang. Um, Roger McMahon, I said, yeah. Um, we need you to come to Bellevue Hospital. We found Janelle Guzman. I was like, OK. And I hung up. But then it hit me. What are you calling me for? Is this good or bad news? Is she alive Am or I dead? going to, to view a dead body or a living body? So, so you didn't even know? I didn't know. At the hospital, McMillan did not immediately recognize his girlfriend. Her face distorted from swelling. What did you say to her? I cried. We both cried.
On the Saturday following the attacks, the New York City Fire Department and the Gansies laid the head of their family to rest. Along the 15-mile procession from the church to the graveyard, civilians and firefighters lined the route, paying their respects to a leader, a neighbor, a best friend. I miss him. I miss him a lot. We were close. You know, I told his wife, I said, you know, you'll never understand this, but Pete and I loved each other. We, we, and we never said it. But we just had that feeling for each other that, that men get. And uh, we were real close. Wasn't anything we wouldn't do for each other. So I need a bus for a removal. For eight months after the attack, at least one Engine 7 firefighter reported daily to Ground Zero to help in the grim recovery effort. What goes through my mind is, is who is this? Who could this be, you know? I, I've lost quite a few close friends, you know? I, I think to myself. Is, is this one of my friends, you know, close friends that I've worked hand in hand with? The usual bravado of the fire station is replaced, at least to some degree, by another feeling. I feel guilty every day, every morning. Every, you know, I'm always, I always feel guilty about it. I don't know why. I guess that's part of surviving something like that. I saw people. People I've walked past, people I worked with, going in, coming out, st stood next to people that are no longer here. Survivor guilt is when you take on more responsibility than, or you think you have more control than you have. Oftentimes the person will feel uh, that he didn't do enough or that uh, he did something wrong or if he had some ability to change the course of events. Engine 7's nickname used to be the Magnificent 7. After September 11th, someone wrote a new moniker on one of the fire trucks, Lucky 7. Right now, I don't feel lucky. I mean, at the, that day, I, somebody, I think somebody jumped up there and wrote that as, you know, as the way we felt that evening. But every day since then don't it's a great thing for a seven engine but the department wasn't lucky that day though janelle guzman fell from the 13th floor she does feel lucky it's just like it's so amazing you know to be here sitting here not in a hospital bed coming to the gym it's it's a great feeling after three surgeries and months of grueling physical therapy, Guzman presses on. Push up. Does it hurt? Yes, it does. <laughs> it it does hurt, especially the stretches. It does hurt. The trauma behind her, Janelle has an eye towards the future. Before you, this all happened to you. What, what were your couple of your hobbies? Uh, dancing. I used to go a lot of parties. <laughs> In July, she danced again with Roger at their wedding. I'm just so thankful to be here that I can see my life in a completely different direction. Um, I just want to have a family, be close to my family, and, you know, just give praise and thanks for just being here. Chief Gancy's family struggles to heal. In their sorrow, solace in a heroic legacy. Would I want my father here to spend time with, to talk to? Of course, you know, but he played his part that day. He was a true hero. It's not that many times you can go around and say that your father is a real all-American hero. Steve Mosiello is moving on. A year after the tragedy, he still gets up at 4.15. He still puts on the coffee and he still unlocks his door. There was no time I don't look over at his house and think about him, think about his family. And that's day in and day out, every day. 
It's getting easier. I'm sure it's getting easier for them, but it will never, ever be easy. Steve Mosiello is leaving the New York City Fire Department in a few weeks. He's retiring. Coming up, revisiting Janelle Guzman, pulled from the ruins on 9-11. A remarkable recovery and a remarkable reunion for a survivor and her saviors. Ahead on People in the News. News. Janelle Guzman remembers falling on September 11th. Falling as the North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed around her. She remembers being trapped. She remembers praying, yelling for help, and finally someone yelling back. But her actual rescue and her rescuers were a blur. Here again is Gary Tuckman. She survived a choking avalanche of concrete and dust, buried alive in total darkness. Janelle Guzman lay wedged in the rubble for 27 hours until rescuers finally heard her cries. On the scene, Brian Buchanan, a former Marine, and Rick Cushman, a National Guardsman. They had rushed down to New York from Boston on September 11th to help with the rescue efforts. Both were attached to the Pittsfield, Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency. Guzman was pulled from the wreckage, fire still burning below her. She was found near two missing firefighters, both of them dead. When she came out, I never got her name, never knew who she was, didn't know if she made it. Just before the rescue, Rick Cushman took these pictures from Ground Zero, including this shot, showing the very pile of rubble that covered Janelle Guzman. Months later, while watching our original report on CNN, Rick Cushman and Brian Buchanan learned of Guzman's fate. Hello. Hi. Hi. Exactly 100 days after the attack, we reunited Janelle Guzman with her two rescuers. When I saw her on the TV and, you know, going through the exercises, I just, I, I about lost it. <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful thing. It really was. And it's, it's even better sitting here with you now. The rescuers filled in some of the blanks in Guzman's shaky memory. The reason you were found was actually because they spotted a fireman's jacket. And then their basic rules are firefighters take care of their own, so a firefighter went up to get him, and that's how you were found. Just as she got to me, um, she sort of opened her eyes and looked up and, and you know, kind of asked me if, if she was out yet. And I said, you know, you, you're, you're just about there, you're good to go. You know, just hold on just a few more minutes and you'll be all right. And Janelle, do you remember saying that? Yeah, I can remember saying that. It do you remember that face? No, <laughs> I can't remember the face. I had less hair. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember the face because, I mean, as much as I opened my eyes, the dust, my eyes would, you know, I could yeah. barely see it with this glance. Her eyes were shut. Very cloudy. Yeah. Now Janelle Guzman can see her rescuers clearly. They are moved and amazed by her survival. You have got to be the luckiest person I've ever seen in my life. Lucky and grateful. After hours of horror and months of recovery, Janelle Guzman expressed heartfelt gratitude to her rescuers. They are my angel. To me, they are an angel to me because as much as I want to forget it, I know I can. I know you're going to live in my memory for the rest of my life. When People in the News continues, four people, four stories of heroism in the face of terror. My guardian angel, because without him, we've been sitting there, like I said, waiting for the building to come down. That's next on People in the News. Firefighters and police officers have come to symbolize the heroes of 9-11, but there were countless individuals who risked their lives that day so that others would survive. Aid workers, volunteers, co-workers, those caught in the moment, and those racing to respond. Here's Maria Inahosa. Every day of her life, a small young woman named Amy Mundorf stares death straight in the eyes. My work, it's like putting together a puzzle. Male, female, how tall were they? Um, what kind of trauma did they have? What did they look like? I think I have the world's best job. The world's best job? Amy works in the New York City morgue as a forensic anthropologist for the chief medical examiner. 
On September 11th, Amy's office gets a call. The Trade Center has been attacked. She must go to the site. This is what her work is all about, the dead. But she was thinking about her own life. When we were driving down, I was scared. I kept saying, you know, what if there's a bomb in the plane? What if we get down there and a bomb goes off? A premonition, perhaps. Minutes after they arrive, the building explodes into rubble, and the rubble consumes tiny Amy. I turned around and I saw that ball, that like tidal wave, coming up close behind me. Amid the mass panic, the voice of her husband, a mountain climber, echoes in her head. If you panic, you die. Get yourself an airspace. So I pulled my jacket over my head, and I kind of braced my arms against the corner of the wall because I knew I would be buried. I knew I would die. I just waited to suffocate. And um, I opened my eyes, and I vomited. <laughs> and it was pitch black, pitch black. And um, I thought I was the only one alive. Bloodied with broken ribs and a huge gash in her head, Amy and her injured co-workers escape. I just kept screaming, I'm alive, because I couldn't believe it still. Any other person might have quit their job right then, might not ever want to go back to a morgue filled with hundreds of bodies, might need time to piece together their own survival in the face of so much loss. But one day later, Amy Mundorf went back to work. I'm the only anthropologist for the city. And that's what I do. So I went back. And I wanted to be with people who had been through it. And I wanted to help out my office. And help all the families who so desperately needed to know had their loved one's body been found. That's Amy's job. And she couldn't let them down. When she was there leading us, those people were treated with the respect and dignity that you would want to be treated with. A burly detective, John Trotter, worked side by side with Amy at the morgue. And though she was in pain, she was still able to give more. There were times when you had to cry. And being a cop, especially the size of me, it wasn't as easy to, to just break down and let your emotions out. Whereas with her, it was just, it was very free flowing. She understood. Understood the life lesson of what it means to be a survivor. Just appreciate life because you don't know when it's going to be taken away from you. Catherine Martin Avery, with her red ringlets and frilly dresses, was the picture-perfect Southern girl. Here she is on her first day of school, with her horses, at graduation, and on the evening of her debutante ball. Yes, a debutante. Catherine was a proper South Carolina belle, but with a difference, with a need to do more, with a need to give. I started thinking about what in my life made me happy when I had been really happy before. And I thought back to my missionary experience in um, Jamaica. I went to Jamaica twice in college and I just absolutely loved it. On September 11th of last year, things were not right with Catherine. She wanted to help, but how? And we signed up to go give blood. Even in Spartanburg, South Carolina, the, the, hour, the wait was three hours long. Days later, she got a call to volunteer at a New York City church this one only two blocks from ground zero. It felt like a war zone. The military police stopped us and, you know, wanted to search the car. The smell was just overwhelming. Um, and I, I really thought this is what it must feel like in, in Bosnia or, you know, in South Africa, these places that have just been torn apart. This sweet, southern 24-year-old was terrified, but there was no time for fear. It's like a sink or swim situation. You either decide that you want to do your best to be successful at this. And, and so in order to do that, you do what you need to do. What she did was to become the head of all the volunteers, in charge of all the supplies pouring into St. Paul's Church. The site was a haven for the rescue workers laboring at a place they called hell. 
it was like heaven, you know, it was beautiful, it was peaceful, it was quiet. Um, people were there to give sacrificially. That was the whole point. Jim Trainer fixes generators for a living. He worked at the pit for nine long months. You're down in the pit, it's, it's hot, it's, it's dirty, you're breathing crappy air, you're filthy, and you know, you walk in to get a little rest or just to have something to eat, and you know, she's standing there waiting, you know, say, hey, darling, come on in. And it just was a genuine, caring attitude that she had. You know, it wasn't, to me, it, it wasn't that she was just doing it as a job. It was, this was what she wanted to do. It was in her heart to, to help us. One year later, Catherine's heart still belongs to New York. She'll open a new office just blocks from Ground Zero, a spiritual foundation called 912. She stays because it was New York that transformed this Southern girl into the woman she is now. A childhood dream and some fatherly advice turns a stock trader into a guardian angel as our look at the heroes of 9-11 continues. Here again is Maria Inahosa. All the little boy in the red bandana Wells Crowther wanted to be when he grew up was a firefighter. He got his first truck when he was two. As a teenager, he became a proud volunteer firefighter in his small New York town. But off Wells went to college. Coming from a family of bankers, lawyers, and writers, he too would become a professional. He got a job as a trader working on the 104th floor of the South Tower of the World Trade Center. He wasn't a fireman, but he was happy. At 9.12, the morning of September 11th, Wells called his mom from inside the Trade Center. Mom, this is Wells. I, I want you to know that I'm okay. A plane had hit the building, and Wells made a fateful decision to become the man he always wanted to be, not the traitor, but a firefighter, a hero, a lifesaver. My guardian angel, there's no ifs and buts, because without him, we've been sitting there, like I said, waiting for the building to come down. A beautiful stranger named Ling Young was on the 78th floor, the bottom floor of where the second plane hit. Before we know it, I heard a big explosion, and I went from one end to another face down. I got up, I couldn't see because my whole glass was filled with blood. I looked around and I was, oh, 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 I see is nobody. I mean, almost everybody was dead. In shock with third degree burns over 40% of her body, Ling and the few survivors simply sat down to wait for help. Then all of a sudden, a gentleman came up and said, I'm mean, out of the stairs. He said, I found this stair, follow me. And he said, uh, stay together, don't go so fast, you know. Take it easy. Then he said, you know, I'm going to go back upstairs. And I realized he had somebody in the back of him. He was carrying somebody in the back. The last thing I know is he went back upstairs. Wells went back up to help even more strangers. How those survivors came to know it was Wells who saved them? They all remembered the red bandana. I taught him when he was a little guy, oh, you know, six, seven years old, to always have the bandana in your pocket. and. Uh, he had it in his pocket on the morning of September 11th, as he would have every day. That day, Wells used the red bandana to protect his face while he gave his life as the building came down upon him. For someone to give up his life for us was just something that not everybody could do. To go through that extent, I don't think I'll be able to do what he did. I think he was blessed by God, and I think he was surrounded by a protection from God to be able to do what he did that day. Wells Crothers, who on September 11th became the person he always dreamed he would be. You know, I thought to myself, this is incredible. He was at 9.05 or 9.06 on Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. He was not Wells Crowther, equities trader. He was Wells Crowther, firefighter. Little David Lim had a big dream, but no role model. He had never seen an Asian police officer, but he knew he wanted to become one. 
And he did, a Port Authority police officer, and later a part of the canine unit with a different kind of partner, a bomb-sniffing dog named Sirius. On the morning of September 11th, David Lim and Sirius were on the job at the World Trade Center when they heard an explosion. David locked Sirius in his cage and ran upstairs to help. I got up to the 44th floor. That's when Tower 2 got hit by the second plane. I worked my way down. David joined the firefighters from Ladder 6, helping a woman descend the stairs until she just couldn't walk anymore. Then, suddenly... We took two steps down from the fourth floor and uh, the building started to shake. You could hear the floors pancaking one on top of the other. Huge explosions. Boom, 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 boom. And faster as they, as they get closer. What I remember the most was the wind. It created almost like a hurricane type force and actually pushed one of the firemen right by me. I was thrown down a flight of stairs. It was a little groggy for a while. I noticed somebody on a half landing just up from me a few steps. And I thought it was one of our guys, and it was uh, David Lynn. It's being a policeman very scary. And that's where David's story shifts from madness to miracle, an extraordinary experience he retells to children at a Korean summer camp to show them that heroism can also have their face. We got up as far as the sixth floor, and I saw a light. I, I remember, and I said, well, maybe there's power on this floor. We can make our stand here. So we start digging towards the light. As it turns out, that light got brighter and brighter, and it was the sun. I said, I couldn't believe it. We were now standing on top of what was left of the World Trade Center. Our staircase was virtually the only thing standing uh, amongst the debris. It was miraculous that we were still alive. He had survived, but what about his partner, Sirius? David tried to go back for the dog, but was turned away. On January 22nd, Sirius's body was found. David returned to Ground Zero to help retrieve his lost canine partner. Sirius was buried with all of the honors of a fallen hero. I understand that people, you know, would not consider the dog as obviously as much as the 3,000 that we lost down there. It was a personal loss to me, of course. They recognized him as a police officer. He wore a badge and um, he did the job like the rest of us and gave his life that day. David now has a new canine partner, Sprig. He misses Sirius, but appreciates being alive, embracing what he sees as a survivor's obligation. I feel that now is one of my responsibilities as a survivor, as a, a, a spokesperson, is to represent the uh, Asian community as well as the Port Authority Police on a positive image. To ring the bell at the stock exchange. Our heroes will now Open the marketplace, the green button. Or drum with some little kids at camp. I did some good that day, you know, helping people. And one of the questions was, well, how come you weren't scared? Who says I wasn't scared? I was scared, but we still had a job to do, though, to help the people. A job to be David Lim, a survivor who's taken his gift of life, his miracle, as a chance to become the role model he never had. A year after the attacks of September 11th, David Lim says he still feels a sense of sorrow, but that it is tempered with a sense of purpose. Mixed emotions, no doubt, shared by many of the heroes and survivors of 9-11. Look for more coverage of the September 11th anniversary in this week's People magazine. That is it for this edition of People in the News. Next week, the man who guided New York through its darkest days and the successor who must now lead the city's recovery. A look at the mayors, Rudy Giuliani and Michael Bloomberg. I'm Paula Zahn. Thanks so much for joining us. And be sure to join me every weekday morning for American Morning right here on CNN. So long.